Okay, so about the delay because of the technical problems. Um, started to talk about uh, stereoisomerisms in coordination compounds. And we briefly reviewed the two basic types of stereoisomers that they can be. So these are enchromas and barristers. So now let's look at a number of stereoisomerisms in coordination compounds and see if they are a form of enantiomerism or a form of diastamerism. So one common stereoisomerism in coordination chemistry is the cis-trans isomerism. So what is meant by that? Um, we mean here <coughs> that we have two ligands in geometrically either adjacent or opposite sides. So this is very common in square planar complexes with the eight metal ions. Among those, uh, platinum complexes are most intensively studied, and probably cis platinum is the most famous um, example of platinum complexes because it's an anti cancer drug. So we can think about two different forms of. Um, Platinum complexes that are square planar and have two amine ligands and two chloral ligands. The first one is the uh, cis complex, as shown here. So here we have two amine ligands in adjacent position and two chloral ligands in adjacent position. This is therefore the cis, cis isomer, whereas over here um, we have the respective trans isomer where the amine ligands and the chloral ligands are in opposite position. So cis trans isomerism is not or need two square planar complexes, though it can also be found with regard to other shapes, for example, octahedral complexes can show the same. So here it's just an example. Um, so here we have a cobalt complex, which is Octahedral. In which we have here two aqua ligands in trans position and here two aqua ligands in cis position. All other um, ligands are the same. So here we have one chloral ligand, one bromo ligand, and one also ledo ligand. So this complex here would be called the trans isomer. This complex here would be called cis isomer. So this just an example um, as to um, how cis trans isomers can also occur in octahedral um, complexes. All right, then very similar or not <coughs> related to cis trans isomer. Which is the Sackmiller isomerism. It's also a form of stereoisomerism in coordination chemistry. So FAC stands for facial, and MER stands for meridional. And uh, by FAC, a FAC isomer, we mean an isomer where ligands of the same type are on the same face of a polyhedron. And we mean or we say we have a mer isomer when the respective ligands are on a plane that bisects the respective bisects the respective molecule. All right. So that's very uh, common in octahedral complexes, but not restricted to those. So let us look at an example. So here we have two octahedral cobalt complexes. One is a mer complex and one is a FAC complex. We see that each of the two complexes have three chloral ligands and three amine ligands. So in this complex on the left hand side, we see that all three chlorine or chloral ligands are located on the same phase of the octahedral, also the three amine ligands are located on the 
same um, phase of the octahedron. Um, whereas over here, where this is the Mer complex, we have the ligands on planes that bisect the bond. So these three chloro ligands make a plane that cuts the octahedron in half. And these three uh, mean ligands here are also on a plane that cuts the octahedron in half. Okay? So that would be this plane here. All right, so some we say uh, these flow ligands lie on one phase, these the mean ligands lie on the same phase two, whereas here the ligands lie on different planes that by six to one. So we can ask well, how these isomers diastemas to each other or are they enantiomers to each other? In order to decide this, we would need to analyze well, are these two isomers mirror images relative to each other or not? Can you answer the question? It should be pretty straightforward. Yes, correct. So they are not mirror images relative to each other. And so they must be diastereomers, not dimensions. All right. Then we can have um, isomerism um, that, or Fagmar isomerism that um, can occur with multi dentate ligands, such as tri dentate ligands, because these tridentate ligands can attach to the metal in, in different ways. It can be that all three points of attachments lie on the same face, or it can be that the three points of attachments build a plane that bisects the molecule. So a uh, tridentate ligand that can do this is this diacyl and triamine um, molecule here. Uh, we can simplify this molecule a little bit by just writing the uh, nitrogen donor atoms connected by a bent line, which just says, which just represents in this case the acetylene ligand. So we can do this just for clarity. And then we can build the respective um, isomers. So here on this side, we have the FAC isomer, and here on the right hand side, we have the Mer isomer. We can see that for this isomer here, we have all the three nitrogen donor atoms lying on the same face. And these three nitrogen donor atoms of the second triacylene um, uh, diamine, no, diacylene triamine ligands also lie on the same face. Whereas over here, um, they lie on planes that bisect the molecule. So these three nitrogens lie here on this plane, and these three nitrogens lie on a plane that is perpendicular to the other plane. Okay, so in some fragmar isomer version, it's uh, often observed with tridentate ligands. Okay, um, then we can have isomerism, which is similar to fact for isomer, isomerism. Um, such isomerism can, for instance, occur with triazole and tetraamine complexes, where we have four points of attachment. We have a tetradentate ligand in this case, and these isomerisms again occur because that multidentate ligand can wrap itself around the uh, center of metal uh, in different, different ways. So in order to uh, retain clarity, we can again simplify 
such a ligand um, a little bit. So we only write the nitrogen donor atoms and we simplify the ethylene for the, the ethylene groups here just by just by bent lines. So now what isomers can we actually construct? Um, so we can wrap around the um, triethylene tetraethylene ligand. Uh, this in this fashion here, where all the nitrogen donor atoms lie actually within the same plane, the remaining positions that are updated can be occupied by other monodentate. So this is one isomer that we can construct. And this uh, isomer is called uh, the trans isomer with three coplanar um, rings because uh, these monodentate ligands here are trans orientation to each other. And all the three rings here meet between the nitrogen donor atoms and the metal lie within the same plane. So now we can move uh, one or more rings uh, out of the plane. So for instance, we can construct isomers in which two rings are coplanar and one ring is not. And this is this is shown here. We see that these two rings are still coplanar, but this ring here is not. Um, co-planar to the other two rings anymore. So that forces the two monodentic ligand X here into uh, cis position. So um, we can see in this case also that while this original molecule here was a non chiral molecule, this molecule here is actually a chiral molecule. Therefore, there must be a mirror image to it, and that mirror image would be the enantiomer to this molecule here, and would, would be another isomer. Okay? <coughs> so therefore, there are two enantiomeric forms of this so-called beta isomer, which has two coplanar rings. Okay? You see, that this molecule here is the mirror image of this one. And this molecule here, the non coplanar ring is on the left side of the molecule. Whereas in this beta isomer, the non coplanar ring is here on the right side of the molecule. All right. So last but not least, we can make all three rings non coplanar, and these isomers are then called um, alpha isomers. And again, there are uh, two enantiomers, two enantiomeric forms for these alpha isomers, because in these rings, the um, a chirality exists, because, the chirality, because of chirality, there must be a so one of the two enantiomers is from here. You see again that the two terminal ligands are in, in this position, but now all the three rings are not within the same plane anymore. Okay. So this ring here is not coplanar to the second ring, which is not coplanar to the third, to the third one here. Okay. So now we can just draw the mirror image of this molecule, and then we arrive. This molecule here you can easily see, verify that this molecule is the uh, enantiomer by checking how the rings are oriented. So this one here, formerly pointed to the left, is pointing to the right. So this one here actually didn't change its, its position. Um, but this one here, which originally pointed to the right, is now pointing to the left. Okay. 
So now, uh, complexes that have non coplanar and non adjacent rings have a special name in coordination chemistry. They are called propeller complexes. In the forum, I would like to talk about propeller complexes in more detail. So, first of all, why are they called propeller complexes? They're called so because the rings that form between the um, ligand and the metal um, are oriented relative to each other like propeller blades in a in a propeller. Okay. Now, uh, propellers are inherently uh, chiral chiral objects. So there can be two kinds of propellers. There can be left-handed propellers, and there can be right-handed propellers. And that kind of nomenclature can also be applied to propeller complexes that have these rings that stand to each other. Uh, like propeller blades stand relative to it. Okay, so when we talk about a left handed propeller, then we mean that uh, we have counter clockwise uh, rotation uh, in the respective medium as uh, the propeller moves away from us. And if you have a Right handed propeller, then we have clockwise. So, what uh, does that mean? That means that the, the tips of the propeller blades describe left and right handed helices respectively. So, a left handed helix, it rotates clockwise through the space. Yeah? The propeller blades would produce a clockwise spiral. And a left handed propeller would produce an anti clockwise spiral as it would move, it would, it would actually move through the, through the medium. So now basically we have to um, make this terminology translate to coordination chemistry and in the forum, I'd like to show you how, how to do this. So you see here an example of a propeller complex. So this is a, a twist of the later complex. So we have a metal ion in the center that can be, for instance, iron, and with three oxalate ligands bound to the metal. So these rings that now form between the metal and the ligand, they are our propeller blades. And we need to determine how do these propeller blades stand relative to each other um, so that we can decide whether our complex should be considered as a left-handed propeller or as a right-handed propeller. All right. Um, so now we have to uh, apply the following, following procedure. We need to determine um, two rings that we want to consider. And we have to move uh, one of the two rings so that it's oriented horizontally and points toward the back. So you have to rotate your propeller monitor in your head so that basically one of the three uh, rings is oriented horizontally and points to the back. Okay, now uh, we can do this. And if we do this, um, then we will have one propeller, uh, so one ring pointing. <coughs> To the back and being oriented horizontally. So we can do actually do this um, in two steps. We can, for instance, take here this ring number one and rotate the molecule 
so that this ring now is actually um, oriented well perpendicular to the paper plane and then we actually rotate by another 90 degrees and then it will be still horizontal but pointing to the back and that's now the second step yeah? do a 90 degree rotation and then our ring number one still or oriented horizontally but would point to the back so now we have completed um, the first step we have now the task to see how our other two propellers are oriented propeller blades are oriented relative to blade number blade number one in order to determine this we can draw uh, lines between the donor atoms of the two propeller blades that we want to consider. So the first one will be certainly propeller blade number one. And therefore, we can just draw a horizontal line through the two donor atoms. And now second, we can pick one of the two propeller blades, other two propeller blades, and also draw a line in between the two donor atoms. So, for instance, we can take propeller blade one. And then we need to decide um, do we have to um, rotate the horizontal line clockwise or anti clockwise to make it parallel to the line number two? Okay. And we want to rotate around the smallest possible angle. Okay, to achieve that, that eclipse. So now you see that in this case, if you, have to, or if you have to rotate this way around, so that would be clockwise. Okay, so therefore we would say we have a right-handed propeller. Okay, so when we have a right-handed propeller, we give it the simple delta, so capital delta. So this would be a twist oscillator ferry. Sorry. All right. So now one can also apply the same principle to more complex examples. So there are also complexes that have multiple rings and require more than one label, uh, delta or lambda. So here's one example. Um, so in this case, you need to determine the habit of each pair of skew rings and then include all the designations to the final description. And the example here is a cobalt EDTA complex. We have encountered the EDTA ligand previously. We have seen that this is a hexadentic ligand. And we have two nitrogen donor atoms, and so the two nitrogen donor atoms are here and two oxygen donor atoms, which are here, 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 and here, okay? So overall, we have five rings to consider here, okay? So that is the ring labeled R3, which connects the two nitrogen donor atoms. And there are other four rings that connect the nitrogen donor atoms with the oxygen donor atoms. Okay, so this nitrogen atom is connected via ring R1 to this oxygen donor atom. And the same nitrogen atom is also connected to via the ring R2 to the second oxygen donor atom. So this nitrogen donor atom here connects via ring R4 to this oxygen and via ring R5 to this oxygen. So now our task is to identify which are the ring combinations that we need to consider for our designations. So remember the definition of a color complex is that the two rings uh, must not be coplanar and they must not be adjacent also. Okay, so we can therefore uh, rule out all the ring combinations where the rings are either coplanar or adjacent. So now you see that 
ring R3 is connected to all other rings. Therefore, we do not need to consider the ring R3 at all, okay? because it's adjacent to all the others. So what you also see is that the ring R4 is coplanar to this ring R2. And what you also see is that the ring R4 is adjacent to ring R5. And you see that the ring R1 is adjacent to ring R2. Therefore, these ring combinations do not need to be considered. So then what's left? Well, that's certainly the combination between R5 and R2, okay? That's the combination R5 and R1. And that's the combination R1 and R4. So these wing combinations do need to be considered. So um, we can go systematically to all the wing combinations, whereby the order is arbitrary. We can just start with what is most convenient to you. So now you see that ring R4 is already oriented horizontally and points to the back. So we do not need to rotate our molecule in order to make any designations. Then we can, we can start with that and then determine um, the designation of the combination R4 and R1 first. All right, so let's just do this. We have to draw a horizontal line to the two donor atoms. But we also have to draw a horizontal line here to these two donor atoms. Okay. And then you have to decide, well, how do we need to rotate that horizontal line? So can you tell me how you would need to rotate it? Clockwise or anti-clockwise? Correct, counterclockwise or anti-clockwise. Good. So anti-clockwise. So that means that we have a lambda designation. Okay. So uh, next we need to consider the other uh, ring combinations. And now we have to rotate our our molecule. So uh, we can rotate our molecule, for instance, around the axis, axis that goes through this oxygen, this coal, and that that nitrogen. As we as we uh, rotate, now we basically um, rotate around around this square here. Okay. And by doing so, we can bring the ring R5 from this position here into that position, okay? And then ring R5 will be oriented horizontally pointing to the back. We then have to see how all the other donor atoms move, okay? Redraw the rings and then uh, continue, continue from there. So, so I rotate around this axis now by 90 degrees. And the result is the following. Like I said, this ring R5 here is now oriented horizontally, points to the back. So um, this oxygen here st stays in place because it's, it's on the axis, okay? But this, this nitrogen here moves by 90 degrees and that moves it into the, this position, okay? And now I need to connect this oxygen with this nitrogen and that makes our ring R2. Okay? So now, um, 
What about the other rings? So our ring R4 was originally here. And now it's actually here. Why is this? Well, this nitrogen doesn't move because it's part of the axis. But this oxygen here moves, moves 90 degrees from this position to that position. So now it's here. And if I connect again this nitrogen with this oxygen, our ring stands now here. So um, now what about the ring R3 here? Well, this nitrogen again stays, but this nitrogen rotates into this position. Okay, therefore our ring R3 is now here. And if I forgotten one, I believe that's all. We have moved all the rings. Yeah. So now this is the result. And of course, we can now determine the orientation of ring R2 relative to R5 and R1 relative to R5. And that's our three remaining designations that are that are missing. So we can just again draw our lines. So again, we first draw the horizontal line. Then, with regard to the ring R1, we have to connect this oxygen with this nitrogen. So, how do we have to rotate the horizontal line? Clockwise or counterclockwise? Clockwise, correct, in this direction. Okay. Um, or you can also draw the arrow here, it doesn't matter. So last but not least, we also uh, need to connect the donor atoms of ring R2 with each other, and that produces this line. So now how do we have to move the horizontal line to make it parallel? Counterclockwise, correct. Good. So this now determines our designation. So we have two counterclockwise rotation and one clockwise rotation. So this means that the designation is, is lambda, delta, lambda, whereby the order of the designations is arbitrary because no root combination has, has a priority. So we could call it also lambda, lambda, delta, or a delta lambda lambda that would be equally correct. Okay, so now we can <coughs> practice this perhaps a little bit together. So here we have um, again a propeller complex, which is simpler and only has two rings. Um, can you determine by rotating the molecule in your in your hand and draw the lines? Whether this is a delta complex or whether this is a lambda complex. We can also draw it on a sheet of paper. If you have a sheet of paper, then it becomes another statement.
So if the right to the long price, does that mean it is delta and it's not long price to the length? Correct. Or delta? Delta, let's see if that's correct. I think that's correct. So we can first uh, just draw the ring R1 by 180 degrees. That's very simple to do. Then the ring R1 is the one that uh, points to the back. And it's oriented horizontally. And then the ring R2. Uh, moves to this position. So this nitrogen atom doesn't move because it's part of the axis around which we rotate. But this nitrogen, as it rotates by 180 degrees now, it moves from here to there. So now it's over here. So next we draw our lines. So that's the horizontal line. That's our second line. So we have to rotate the horizontal line clockwise to make it parallel and that means that we have a delta complex. Okay. So um, last but not least, we can also look at ring conformation. So not only uh, configurations um, determine the overall shape, the conformation um, and conformers also play a role uh, in, the overall, in the overall shapes. And again, the conformations can either be um, lambda and delta, okay? Now, what's the difference between um, the, uh, the conformer and the respective? In, in an isomer, when you have an isomer, then we have different points of attachments, right? But when you have a conformal, the points of attachments do not vary. Okay. But nonetheless, the structure is, is different because the rings are well, shaped differently. So here are just uh, is just one example. So um, here's an ethylene diamine ligand that attaches to a metal. We have to consider now that this ring is not planar because of the sp3 hybridization at the nitrogens and at the carbons. So therefore, there are different conformers, conformers possible. Okay. So <clears throat> here you see the different different conformers, and what the different conformers are becomes the the clearest when we uh, look actually uh, from a bird's perspective on the uh, metal nitrogen, nitrogen bonds. So now the metal nitrogen bonds here, they point out of the plane toward us. And then there's two ways the carbon, carbon bond can be oriented. So the first possibility is that the carbon, carbon bond is oriented as shown here. And the second possibility is that the carbon, carbon bond is oriented as shown over there. Okay, so we see again that these two conformers are mirror images to each other. So that, is a, that structure here is a mirror image to that structure. Okay. And one of the two conformers is a so-called lambda conformer, and the other one is called a delta conformer. So how would you, do we sign this? We do this just the same way we did previously for the, for the isomers. We can basically draw a line, uh, draw a line between the two nitrogen donor atoms here, and then the second line would go through the two carbon, carbon atoms, which are not explicitly shown here. And then again, you need to determine, well, how do I have to ro rotate that horizontal line? Okay, and see that in this case here, you have to rotate it counterclockwise. So for that reason, this would be uh, 
Alam dan dalam dan konfirman. While over there, you would, you would have to rotate this horizontal line counterclockwise, and that would um, then represent the delta conformant. Okay. So now, in the in the isomorphism, we use capital lambdas and capital deltas in order to make this designation. If we designate conformers, then we use lowercase letter. This would be lowercase lambda conformer, and this would be a lowercase um, delta. Okay, so this is what I wanted to tell you about isomerism. We have now closed this sub chapter and can answer lecture here.